welcome everyone. We'll get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep, okay, excellent. Um, so I am very, very excited to have our guest with us here today, Father John Oliver, who is the priest at St. Elizabeth's Orthodox Church in Murfreesboro. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles and essays and uh, two books, Touching Heaven, Discovering Orthodox Christianity on the Island of Belém, and Giver of Life, the Holy Spirit in the Orthodox Tradition. Um, Father John holds a degree in English from Malone University in Canton, Ohio, and completed his graduate studies at St. Tikhon's Orthodox Theological Seminary. Uh, later, he joined the faculty at that institution as an instructor in Old Testament and New Testament and American religious history. He lectures regularly on practical ways of developing an Orthodox Christian worldview and the mystery of Christ in places and persons around us. And he and his wife, Laura, have three daughters uh, who are students here at OTSU and two sons. Uh, so we're really, really thrilled to have Father John with us. Uh, he will lecture for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for a Q&A. So uh, please join me in welcoming Father John. Hi, everybody. Hey, can I see a thumbs up or something? Oh, look at that. Look at you. You're beautiful. It's the next the best thing to being in person. Wow, look at all these. There are so many of you that I have not one, but two screens I can flip back and forth from. So I can see two screens of people sleeping. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> wow. Well, it's really great to see you. Thank you very, very much for spending uh, part of your afternoon here uh, with what is a, a most worthy lecture series, present company excluded. Seriously, you've got some really terrific speakers and it looks like some really great content um, coming up. So I might bribe Dr. Rebecca for maybe I can hang out a little bit in the shadows and listen to some of the talks. But, um, but it's great to spend some time with you and it's good to be uh, included uh, as part of this community. And my support is very much with you as you navigate uh, very uncertain waters. You are finding your way. I tell the people in our parish, it's a little bit like the COVID phenomenon is the rock and the stream, and you're the water finding your way around it, moving forward uh, in hope. So <clears throat> it's just uh, good to be able to participate in this format. So we're going to uh, begin with a crisis. We'll begin with a crisis. The word crisis comes from an Indo-European word, which literally means to sift, like to sift gold away from dirt or mud away from gold. Uh, it is to sift what's really important in life away from what's not so important. So let's begin with a crisis. God willing, it won't ever happen to any of us, but just as an exercise, imagine your living space has caught fire. You awaken to find so much of what you hold dear covered in smoke and flame. All of the sentient beings in your life, family, loved ones, roommates, friends, pets, are safe. But you have two minutes to carry to safety from your material possessions only what is most dear to you. What do you take? Do you grab the guitar but leave the waffle iron? Take the book on the table but leave the table itself? What do you grab? And more importantly, why do you grab that? You probably grab physical possessions that hold some significance for you greater than their chemical makeup, right? So you take the photo, not because it's a combination of carbon and color, but because she's your dear grandmother. You take the ticket stub, not because it's paper and ink, but because that's the color where you met your significant other. You take the porcelain knickknack or the artwork or the heirloom, 
not because they weigh less physically, but because they weigh a great deal emotionally. In the broadest sense of the word, each of these is an icon, an icon, a connection between the material and the immaterial, a physical window that peers onto a spiritual world, a sensory touch point that opens onto a depth of experience that provides a fuller experience of being alive. Now, when we step back for a broader view of our lives, we might discover an iconographic depth we did not realize. The way we cook, the phone in our pockets, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, the teams we follow, our choice of brands, the way that we turn a phrase or make an expression reminiscent of some relative earlier in life. All of these may be driven by a motivation greater than just utility. We might cling to certain physical contours of our lives over others because of greater meanings or memories. We might even say that the mask, the mask has become an icon in the sense that it means so much more than fabric and elastic, right? Battle lines are drawn by just three square inches of material. Now, our handy internet dictionary defines iconography as symbolic representation, especially the various meanings attached to an image or images. So once again, iconography is a symbolic representation especially the various meanings attached to an image or imagery. This gives us a chance to spend a moment with an ancient word, the word symbol, the word symbol. When the New Testament of the Bible uses the word symbol, it has in mind a more mystical sense than is commonly presumed. The Greek word here, symbolon, means a joining of two realities in which neither reality is diminished. So a symbol is a joining of two realities in which neither reality is diminished. Now, for the classical Christian tradition of which I am a part, for example, the reality of bread is joined to the reality of Christ's body in a way in which neither reality is diminished. Is it still bread? Yes. Is it body? Yes. The reality of wine is joined to the reality of Christ's blood in a way in which neither reality is diminished. Still wine? Yep. Blood? Sure. How? Have no idea. Have no idea. It is a presence to be experienced rather than a concept to be explained. Now, a religious icon, such as the one that you hopefully see before you on your screen, a religious icon is a symbol in the sense that it unites the reality of what we can see, wood, paint, what we can see, and it unites it to the reality of what lies beyond sight and touch in a way that doesn't diminish either reality. So does it remain wood and paint? Sure. Does it take on some special grace, some special meaning? Sure. How this union happens, we have no idea. Because once again, it is a presence to be experienced rather than a concept to be explained. Before he beds down each night, a soldier out on a tour of duty kisses a photograph of his wife and baby girl who wait for him back home. He knows he is not kissing their actual selves. Rather, he is venerating, showing respect to an object that connects his reality right here with their reality far away. This is why icons might be better understood, not with the head, but with the heart. 
So let's unpack this icon before us and see if it might have implications for how we see the world. Absent here in this particular icon are the usual features that we might associate with popular art. Familiar lines, uh, natural proportions, Renaissance style realism. Present here instead is an unusual beauty, even a disorienting beauty. The beauty that the Russian writer Dostoevsky, very familiar with Orthodox Christian icons like these, believed will save the world. Beauty will save the world, Dostoevsky says through one of his characters. So let's take a moment to recall that conversation from which that famous line comes. It comes from Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot. It's a shame he stole the title of my autobiography. Anyway, so there's an unpleasant character, a young man named Hippolyte, dying from tuberculosis. He's speaking to Prince Mishkin, who's the central and Christ-like figure of the novel. Hippolyte asks Mishkin, is it true, Prince, that you once declared that beauty will save the world? The prince listens, but does not reply. So a little later, Hippolyte continues to question him, what beauty will save the world? Hippolyte clearly thinks that the answer to his question has something to do with God. However, for Prince Mishkin, Beauty is not always softly and gently divine. It is also tough and uncompromising and truth-telling. When Hippolyte demands more champagne, the prince replies, no, you're not to drink any more, Hippolyte, I won't let you. And he moves the glass away. This is a grim gesture of beauty because of its love for the well-being of another. The beauty that Prince Mishkin has in mind, the kind that he feels will save the world, is not always sensually appealing or according to popular taste. It is truthful, it is free from falsehood, and it is even dogmatic in the sense of clinging to objective right and wrong. The icon before us can be considered beautiful, but in a way that transcends an easy grasp of that word. It might be sensually appealing to some, but its chief aim is not to be pretty. Its chief aim is to transmit truth. It is a delivery mechanism for truth. And it transmits that truth in line and color according to very strict centuries-old traditions. So the icon wants to reach the heart with a message of hope, and we'll unpack the icon as we go. So we might even say then that the real beauty of, at least in my tradition, the real beauty of a Christian icon lies in beautifying the viewer. The real work of art is not the wood and paint before us. It is the human being who is doing the viewing. So the idea is not so much that the human being meditates on an icon. It's that the icon meditates on the human being. So let's focus on one particular feature of this icon. This is an icon that dates back to about the fifth century. In this icon, the central figure here is Christ. And this icon is a scene of what has happened, according to the Christian tradition, after Christ has been crucified, but before he is risen from the dead. So it's after his crucifixion, but before his resurrection. So according to the Christian narrative, Christ descends into Hades and he rescues Adam and Eve, who to this point are imprisoned by death. 
They are kept in bonds by death from which there is no escape. But Christ, who is the author and giver of life in this tradition, descends to rescue Adam and Eve, and therefore, in a broader sense, rescue human nature from death and all of its manifestations. So this particular icon has a feature that I want to narrow in on, and I want to consider its implications for how one might see the world. Notice this almond shape right here. Forgive me if there's a glare, but it's an almond-shaped iconographic feature, and it's called a mandorla, mandorla, uh, which in Italian means almond, almond. So the mandorla is an almond-shaped iconographic feature. It's a clue that something is going on that we should pay attention to. So what is it doing here? What is it provoking us to see? Well, what it's provoking us to see can be brought into sharp relief, another term of art, by considering a sobering reality, a sobering reality that is unique to our time and place in history. So a brief bit of cultural commentary. What is the human being? What is the human being? We appear simple, yet we sense intuitively that there lurks within each of us an astonishing depth and complexity. There may be a more urgent question, however, than asking what, and that is why? Why? Why even ask? Why explore the human person, this physical collection of vast and complex variables? Why explore what it means to be alive? Every discipline, every discipline you're studying in MTSU, psychology, for example, or sociology, or the humanities, has its rationale for addressing the question of what it means to be human. Yet in our time, we undertake this exploration not because it's interesting, but because it is urgent. We explore the nature of the human person because it is now a matter of survival. The human race has reached an unprecedented stage in global history. We have achieved a risky fusion of desire and technology so that the annihilation of entire regions of people, indeed portions of the planet itself, is now possible through weapons of extraordinary power. The destruction of life has been occurring, of course, since Cain killed Abel, but this is different because now is different. The proclivity toward aggression and violence is the same, but if Cain used a rock against his brother then, he could launch a warhead now, nuclear, biological, chemical, and Abel, is no longer a single human. He's now a town, or a tribe, or a city, or a nation. What God has created for good, the darkness of man is probing for evil. The intricate layers of nature are being mined or raped, as Francis Bacon encouraged, for their secrets. And while what we find there should result in a sense of wonder and silence before the creator. The darker tendencies of humanity are twisting matter and antimatter, not into worship, but into weaponry. The unleashed power of the atom changed everything, Einstein wrote, except our thinking. From one point of view, our crisis is not political but spiritual. Before such annihilation of people and the ecosystems on which they depend is possible, conceivable, a certain kind of theology has to be in a certain way of thinking. The human being, you, 
have to be seen as dispensable, stripped of all your transcendence and subservient to larger political or economic purposes. You have to be seen as merely a cog in a machine or as an obstacle to a goal. So we can now devastate the earth. That's the bad news, but it's also the real news. And as MTSU's best and brightest minds, you will stay disciplined thinkers only as you deal with reality, with the way things really are. So with our mad desire for power sadly in place and our sophisticated technology rapidly developing, who can imagine what the future holds? Who can imagine what the future holds? It may be that your generation in particular faces three choices. One, do nothing. Do nothing and continue to exist in a world in which the only principle worth pursuing is power. Self power, tribe power, nation power, power without limit or conscience or accountability. A second choice, one massive world government without limit, vested with total authority over all nations to enforce order upon the world. Or three, pursue a higher ethic, fight for a higher way. The first choice of doing nothing means that we continue as normal. But as one Canadian singer songwriter observed, the trouble with normal is it always gets worse. The second choice of one massive world government too easily tilts toward tyranny. And the British historian Lord Acton certainly had history on his side when he wrote that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what about that third choice, that higher ethic, that higher way? That third choice is hiding in the theology of the icon. Here we get back to that iconographic feature called the mandorla, the almond shaped orb that surrounds the person of Christ in this icon. What is it doing there? What is it provoking us to see? A mandorla is an iconographic technique that indicates that the person or the event it surrounds in that particular scene is not visible merely to the eyes of flesh. It is only visible to the eyes of faith. So here we see a mandorla around Christ as he descends into hell to rescue Adam and Eve. That is an event that no one biologically saw, but it's an event that people might be able to spiritually see if they carry any hope that humanity is redeemable. Here's a couple of other examples. Here's an icon of what is called the Transfiguration. So this is an icon taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Christ is here on the top of Mount Tabor, next to the prophets of Moses and Elijah. On top of the mountain, and here are Peter, James, and John freaking out. There they are. Why are they freaking out? Because Christ, according to the narrative, is radiating with divine light. Now notice that he is inside of a mandorla. So not just any shepherd walking the base of Mount Tabor could see that event. Only the disciples present and the prophets. Here's another example of a mandorla. Here's Christ risen from his tomb. Nobody was physically present to see that stone roll away and him to emerge from the tomb. So it wasn't visible to the eyes of flesh, 
but it is visible for some to the eyes of faith, to the eyes of faith. So the mandorla suggests sacred space, sacred space, where the eyes of flesh would see only the material plane, the eyes of faith see a union of the material and the spiritual, the earthly and the heavenly. The mandorla in the Christian icon is equivalent to the kabod in Jewish writing, the kabod, K-A-B-O-D in Jewish writing. Kabod in the Old Testament is translated into Greek as doxa, glory. So kabod or doxa is used in the text whenever the presence of Yahweh is extraordinarily manifest. As a bright cloud, or as a column of fire. The mandorla of an icon reveals that something is going on in that scene that was beyond anyone's capacity to control or to manipulate, but is still spiritually comprehensible. Our best moments with beauty are like that. A mountain stream, a sleeping infant, a forest walk, a Bach piece, something beyond our capacity to control and manipulate, but spiritually comprehensible. We don't have words to explain why it affects us. We just know on an experiential level, we are affected. So to see the world iconographically is to behold a mandorla around every single human being. And now we get to why beauty might save the world. To see the world iconographically is to behold a mandorla around every single human being. To gaze upon a human being exclusively through the eyes of flesh is to see perhaps someone who is fixed in their fallen state. Someone whose future is automatically defined by their troubled past. But to gaze upon a human being through the eyes of faith, of hope, of possibility, of transcendence, as if surrounded by sacred space, is to see possibility. It is a hopeful disposition. It is a posture of the heart. Therefore, to gaze upon a problem or an issue, even nature itself, through the eyes of faith is to see so much more possibility than merely gazing through the eyes of flesh. Iconography can help with this. To stand surrounded by icons, as I do in my tradition, is to stand in the presence of change the presence of transformation, the presence of possibility, the mere exposure to changed persons reminds us that persons can change. Persons can transform in spite of how fixed their or our fallen state appears to be. So what does the icon do? It helps us resist imprisoning people in labels, good, bad, right, wrong, smart, stupid, friend, enemy. Potential, no potential. This labeling perspective is dangerous because of the tendency not just to define persons, but to lock them in the choices of their past. So when we stand before a religious icon, we are unsettled, we are challenged. One of the most hideous phrases we could ever utter to another human being is, you will never change. There is no sacred space around you. Sure, free will is the most powerful on earth. 
Sure, a history of poor choices sometimes indicates a future of poor choices, but the icon shows that transformation can bust through at any time. And the icon helps us to live in a state of perpetual hopefulness. To say that I'm done with this person is not the same as saying this person should be done with. Sometimes transformation comes suddenly. Other times it's positively glacial. So perhaps some of you as friends and colleagues and roommates, perhaps some of you have traveled for a long time beside a troubled soul through the peaks of hope and the valleys of disappointment. And sometimes the pain can be overwhelming because the greater the love, the greater the suffering. Vulnerability is love's most terrifying dimension. When the desire to see a person transfigured collides with the reality of those choices day after day, it can be exhausting. And the icon helps us to restore that hopefulness. So uh, we end our discussion, at least this part of it, with an appeal to the urgency of having it. The church, civilization, higher learning, the community of humanity, these have been the traditional restraints that have kept humanity from slipping toward large-scale catastrophe. And these restraints seem to be losing their influence over the hearts and minds of humanity. An icon, in this case, a religious icon, might carry some encouragement to the contrary. When a member of my church, St. Elizabeth's, enters the worship space. They are surrounded by icons like this. They pause before an icon and they make a sign of a cross and they lean forward and just like that soldier who's on his tour of duty far from home, they kiss the icon because it's proof that transformation is possible. And it is through those very same eyes that we hope to view all humanity, every person, the cosmos itself. You may be familiar with that biblical phrase that the human being is created in the image of God. That word image is ikonos in Greek, ikonos, icon. So strictly speaking, it is the human being who is the truest icon of anything divine. And that beauty, it might get soiled, it might get obscured, but it can never truly be lost. That is a bit of a perspective on why iconography for some could be a key to seeing the world through more hopeful, more transfiguring possibility. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great conversation. Uh, thank you, as always, for your wisdom and your generosity and uh, for teaching us. Uh, Classes dismissed. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to see already, Father John, the students in the chat have all expressed how their gratitude and how beautiful this was. So you have created a high standard for the rest of the, uh, the participants in our lecture series to, uh, to meet. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a bit. So if students have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to ask then, um, but otherwise you are free to go. So thank, thank you, you again. And thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for participating.